Hello, I am Dr. Shivoma Ratpale from GG Hospital, consultant anesthesiologist, Srivantra. Now I'll be presenting a short topic on the role of steroid in clinical anesthesia practice. Steroids are widely used in present day anesthesia. Supplementation of steroid during surgery is claimed to have beneficial effect in enhancing recovery for reducing post-operative pain in reducing the post-op nausea vomiting, reducing the airway edema due to surgery, and to help patients with hyperactive airway presenting for surgery. Now, steroids is a normally produced hormone by the adrenals in, in our body. During surgery, it has or stress or illness, it has antigestional roles, and so steroid has to be enhanced during this period. It has a major metabolic effect to mobilize energy to overcome the stress. It has an anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive effect to limit injury caused by surgery, stress, or illness. It also helps us to maintain a good cardiac output and vascular tone. It, it, it improves the overall skeletal muscle function, the neuronal and cognitive effect on the brain also helps to enhance recovery from surgery and, and anesthesia. Now, cortisol production is not same for all surgeries. It increases from 2 to 20 times depending on the type of surgery, the duration of surgery. Maximum increase is seen 30 minutes after extubation, that is towards the end, and it remains high up to 72 hours. After five to six days, it starts coming down to reach the normal baseline. This increase in steroids can be suppressed by using high doses of opioids and by using regional anesthesia techniques. Now I'll talk of common scenarios where we'll be using steroids during surgery and in our critical care setup. First is as replacement therapy in adrenal insufficiency. When there is cortisol deficiency, it has to be replaced with cortisol. Stress dose supplementation on patients on chronic steroids also, we have to use steroids. Post-op nausea vomiting can be reduced using steroids and it's part of multimodal analysis protocols used by different people. In traumatic spine injury, steroids are found to have a role. Cerebral edema due to certain causes can be controlled using steroids. In patients with hyperreactive airway coming for surgery, steroid has found to be, be useful. It also in ICU settings for extubation patient on mechanical ventilators, patient with severe sepsis, COVID patients requiring oxygen or on mechanical ventilation, all benefit with the use of steroids. We also use steroids to deal with common emergency situations like severe allergy and anaphylaxis, thyroid crisis, hypercalcemia due to calcitriol excess. First, we, I'll be talking on the replacement therapy where we use steroids. Cortisol is deficient either due to primary or secondary causes, either due to causes in adrenal or the pituitary gland or the hypothalamus. Here, we have to replace cortisol and during surgery, we have to give the extra dose which is required. Another replacement therapy where we use steroid is in patients on chronic steroids as a stress dose therapy. Stress doses, steroids in doses greater than 15 to 20 milligram for more than three weeks can lead to suppression of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. And this suppression lasts from three months to variable years. So during surgery or stress or illness, such patients cannot secrete excess steroid that is needed to overcome the stress. So stress dose is recommended to prevent steroid deficiency and adrenal crisis during surgery. There is no class A or class B evidence to support this replacement, but most people give short dose of steroids on patients with chronic steroids. Short-term steroids have no major morbidity other than producing hyperglycemia. So such a short course of steroids is not going to produce a major harm. 
Salem et al. proposed a replacement regime for patients on chronic steroids. How to replace these patients with stress dose? Depending on the surgery, but if the surgery is a minor surgery, usual, the usual oral dose the patient is taking plus 25 milligram hydrocortisone IV at the time of induction is given. In moderate surgeries like abdominal hysterectomy, hernia repair, etc., 25 milligram at induction plus extra of 100 milligram per day over 24 hours should be supplemented. For major surgeries like cardiopulmonary bypass or Whipple's procedure, etc., we have to give the usual oral dose plus 25 milligram at induction and 100 milligram per day for two to three days. Wherever possible, it's better to give it as an infusion rather than bolus doses to maintain a constant level. Induction, inducing agent etomidate when used is known to suppress steroid secretion for six to six hours. But in such being a short duration suppression, steroid replacement is not indicated in patients induced with etomidate. But if you are using etomidate as a Sedate, IV infusion in as a sedation for long period, then you may have to give steroids or monitor the cortisol level. Most of nausea vomiting is a common problem and difficult to manage. Steroids are very useful in preventing post of nausea vomiting. Ex effects of steroid in post of nausea vomiting is thought to be mediated in the brain, either through the glucocord corticoid receptors in the brain or by altering the permeability of the blood-brain barrier or decreasing the synthesis of prostaglandin. Adult doses for, of steroid to treat post op nausea vomiting is dexamethasone 2.5 to 10 mg IV. You can is, use methylprednisone 250 mg IV in place of dexamethasone. It should be ideally given one hour prior to the surgery or at least by the time of induction. The peak action is after 8 to 10 hours and it lasts up to 3 days. It's mainly useful to prevent the late vomiting. This is a study showing the use of intravenous steroid at induction for adult tonsillectomy patient and the study concluded that it, is, it was very useful to reduce nausea vomiting in post-operative period. The dream trial showed that dexamethasone given during intra period was useful in preventing post-operative nausea vomiting in GI surgeries. The incidence of vomiting was less in dexamethasone arm than the standard care arm. And also the demand for antiemetic remained less in dexamethasone group for 72 hours. There was no any increase in complication due to use of steroid. Another use is when we deal with patients with hyperreactive AV. In this patient, steroid pro produce an anti-inflammatory effect, an anti-edema action, and also it improves the ang action of bronchodilators in which the patient is already on. No arm is then giving a short course of steroid for five to seven days. Oral pregnisolone oral dexamethasone or IV hydrocortisone can be used for this purpose. Kamran Mahesh et al. did a study of dexamethasone in pediatric age group and found that the incidence of cough, laryngeal spasm, desaturation were less in patients with dexona rather than standard care patients. Now I'll come to the role of steroid in ICU. In extubating patients on mechanical ventilator, and to prevent stridor immediately after extubation, steroid has found to have a role. In adults, multiple doses of, doses of steroid started at least 12 to 24 hours prior to the planned extubation, prevents post-extubation stridor and pre-intubation. In neurons also, NNA et al. showed that it has benefit in reducing post-extubation stridor. The benefit in children was not so marked and it was limited to children with abnormal AV or AV edema. Now we'll come to the use of steroid in management of pain. Steroid is already a part of multimodal analgesic regimes as suggested by IRAS and Society for Ambulatory Anesthesia. 
It can be given IV or along with local anesthetic to manage pain. It has been used in cancer pain as an adjunct, especially in bone pain and neuropathic pain. There is a strong grade A evidence supporting its use in pain. Analgesic effect may not be due to the direct effect, but may be due to its anti-inflammatory or immunosuppressive effect on injured tissue. When used broccoli, it suppresses ectopic dis discharge from injured nerve. Doses of steroid dex dexamethasone used for this purpose is 4 to 8 milligram, and it can be added to local anesthetic when given as a block. Axial block given with steroid have significant increase in duration compared to stand control groups. If dexamethasone is not available or contraindicated, methylprednisolone also can be used for this purpose. The optimum dose of steroid for management of pain is unclear, but higher doses do not improve pain score and it's not recommended. In giving IV, instead of mixing with local anesthetic in nerve blocks, also I found to have the same effects in recent studies. So if you don't want to mix steroids with brachial plexus block, you can give it IV at the same time to get the same results. This is a study showing the efficacy of dexamethasone in controlling pain following total hip replacement. And the study shows that the post-operative opioid re requirement for 48 hours was less, and also its additional benefit was that post-op nausea vomiting and length of stay was less in patients treated with steroid rather than control group. Another common area where we have to use steroid is back pain. Here we give steroid as an epidural steroid injection. Back pain due to radiculopathy or spinal canal stenosis mainly benefit from steroids. There are three routes commonly used, transforaminal, interlamella, and caudal routes. Methylprednisolone or trimcelanone, 40 to 80 milligram, can be used for this purpose, and they have comparable effect. Repeated injections are more effective than a single injection. Be cautious. Repeated infection can, injections can cause HPA suppression. Now, spinal cord injury. High dose methylprednisolone is the only effective drug therapy for spinal cord injury. It prevents secondary injuries due to edema and protein lysis in the nerve. It should be administered within three hours. 30 milligram per kg bolus IV followed by infusion of 5.4 milligram per kg per hour over 24 hours is recommended. If for if it could not be administered within three hours, then the infusion duration should be prolonged to 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Safety of this treatment has been questioned by some, but NASIS-3 showed neurological benefit with early treatment with methylprednisone. Cochrane database systematic review of 2012 also showed that neurological outcome was better in patients treated with steroid than those without steroids. Now, cerebral edema is common after head injury. The crash study has shown that there is no role of steroid in treating cerebral edema due to head injury. And it, actually, the risk of death was higher in patients put on steroid. So it's obsolete to give steroids in a cerebral edema due to head injury. But cerebral edema due to brain tumors benefit with the use of steroids. Brain cancers, parasitic infections of brain, metastatic in the brain, etc., can be treated with steroids. Dexamethasone, 4 mg, 4 times is recommended, up to a maximum dose of 32 mg. Once the neurological improvement is seen, it should be tapered to the lowest possible dose. All pituitary tumors do not need steroid replacement. ACTH producing Cushing's disease type of pituitary tumors need perioperative hydrocortisone replacement. Now we come to an ICU situation, sepsis. In severe sepsis, BP not improving, even after adequate volume and maximum vasopressor therapy may need steroid. Hydrocortisone, 200 milligram IV infusion, over 24 hours is a usual steroid use in management of sepsis. It helps to restore systemic vascular resistance and improve cardiac output. Whether this improves the survival 
well of the patient, it's still unclear. Initial study by Anani et al. in 2002 showed that the mortality was reduced with the use of steroid. But subsequent study, like the corticus trial, adrenal trial of 2018, and approach trial of 2018 did not show mortality benefit. A recent trial by Paul E. Marek giving hydrocortisone for seven days along with vitamin C and thiamine for four days showed mortality benefit with the use of steroid. It also showed that organ dysfunction was reduced and the duration of vasopressor treatment required also was less. Now we treat COVID patients also with steroids. COVID patients on oxygen or on mechanical ventilation or having severe ARDs benefit by 10 days of steroid treatment. The recovery trial done in UK showed that 6 mg per day of dexamethasone for 10 days improved mortality. Early and mild cases do not benefit with the use of steroid and should not be given. Inhaled steroids did not show any benefit or harm. Another common situation where we use steroid is when patient aspirates and anesthesia. Actually, steroid is not beneficial here and it, there is increased gram-negative pneumonia in patients treated with steroid for aspiration. So it's not recommended. Then in preventing allergy, there is no role of giving steroid. It does not prevent allergy or anaphylaxis and there is no evidence to show that. It does not also prevent the delayed reactions seen in anaphylaxis or allergy. So role of steroid is not very much in this situation. But still, since there is no severe adverse outcome due to the use of steroid in treatment of allergy, people continue to still use it. And if you're using it, IV hydrocortisone or methylprednisone can be used. IV, IV hydrocortisone is preferred because it has, acts faster within two hours. We come to a conclusion that steroids have a definite perioperative role. Short course of steroids will not produce any major serious harms. So there is no need to be scared of that. But we still need further studies to explore whether use of steroid in perioperative period for short duration is beneficial or not. There is chance that there is underreporting of certain side effects, especially like insomnia, psychiatric problems, etc., and may be underreported. And patients sent home as a day case may not report all the side effects. So we don't know about them. Hydrosteroids and prolonged use are definitely harmful and should not be done in perioperative period. Thank you.